And now part three, starting with Healthy People 2020. Access to health care and improved health are both major issues for health policy. It is a continuance of Healthy People 2000 that we didn't quite make. 2010, we did not make. 2020, we did not make, right? And the goals are important here, and I would know these. One is to increase the quality and years of healthy life, and two is to eliminate health disparities among Americans. So we're doing much better. We're living uh, to older ages now. That, number one, is going quite well. But eliminating health disparities among us is still a problem. And I mean, very simply, the truth is, if your skin is not white and you do not have a lot of money, your cardiac outcomes are different, say, with heart failure than in people who are Caucasian and who have a lot of money. And that's not right. The document contains hundreds of health objectives based on numerous focus areas. The objectives relate to equal access, availability, cost, and quality of care. And it's used to understand the health status of the nation and plan prevention programs. Individuals, communities, and organizations are responsible for determining how to meet the goals of Healthy People 2020. And of course, it's evaluated at the local level. Reporting statutes require practitioners to report specific health-related information, and these vary somewhat from state to state, but commonly involve things like criminal acts and injuries from a dangerous weapon. They have to be reported to the police, but uh, you usually don't have to worry about that. The police say if there's gunshot wound trauma, the police are right behind the stretcher. And so I make the point that if you walk out of the trauma room and there's a couple of police officers there and they ask you, well, how did it go or what's the plan, can you tell them? And the answer is yes, you are not breaching confidentiality, it's not a HIPAA violation, and frankly, you're required to as these are representatives of the law. In most states, the MP must notify the health department of five diagnoses with their patients. And the big ones are HIV, TB, and three STD, STIs, GCS, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Glasgow Coma Scale is an easy way to remember that. GCS, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, and TB. Animal bites have to be reported to Animal Control, which is a subsidiary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And suspected or actual child or elder abuse, as it relates to us, must be reported to the police, but it is done via social services. So that's who actually picks up the investigation, does a nice job interviewing the family and everything to report what's needed. And then remember with domestic violence, NPs are not legally required to report this in some states. Uh, a lot of states do have a reporting system, but they are not legally required to report it in all states, okay, at this time. Collaborative practice exists to enhance the quality of care and to improve patient outcomes. And I really encourage you, if this is your first NP job, to ask in your interview, when you get down to the point and they say, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, you know, um, could you share with me your definition of collaboration? And watch what happens. The body language, the eye movement, do they try to answer your question? Because, see, the ANA statement says that collaboration is a true partnership in which all the players have and desire power, they share common goals, and yet they recognize and accept separate areas of responsibility and activity. So that physician that you're about to work for or that practice, you know, they should say, wow, well, nobody's really ever asked me that before, but... Let me think how I would answer you. You know, I think for us, collaboration is, so they're trying to answer you. And that would be somebody that I would enjoy working for because they plan to collaborate. 
And the opposite is true as well. If they don't answer that, if they kind of take it off as a joke or just ignore it, you can bet that they do not have a framework that involves collaboration. And you're going to get to do the scut work that they don't want to do on weekends, nights, holidays, and never see the light of day again on the shifts that you work. Now, navigating the healthcare system for patients. This is important because if you don't really have a feel for the system, you're not going to do well on some questions that you might draw on the exam. But before I get into looking at, you know, several of these sources, let's practice a question or two. A patient is having trouble feeding himself after a stroke. Which consultation is most warranted? physical therapy, case management, occupational therapy, or social services? And the answer is C, occupational therapy. Speech therapy, which does the swallow testing, is underneath occupational therapy. While rounding one morning, a 63-year-old patient seems agitated. In asking her how she's doing, she frowns and mumbles, you know, I'm just fed up with John. We were married 37 hard years, and he thinks he's better off with that new little young girly wife. I think when I get out of here, I'm just going to finish him on off and teach him a thing or two. What do you do? And the answer is D, consult psychiatric service. So again, don't call the police. Can you imagine them arriving, you know, with their gun and their baton and all that? Well, what are they going to do? Is she like uh, gesturing? Is she for real? I mean, she's in the hospital. So it's not for the police. Uh, hopefully you wouldn't just document it and move on, right? Social services or psych. In this case, it is not social services job to investigate something strange, shall we say, that a person says. She basically is threatening to kill her ex-husband. And who would actually do a workup and an interview with that patient? It would be psychiatric mental health, right? So the question comes to when do you call social service and when do you call psych? And I'll clarify that for you here in just a second. So social services, what are, what's really are some of their jobs? I don't have any money. I don't have any insurance. I don't speak English. I really don't live in this country. I was just here on vacation. Uh, I don't have any money at all to pay my bill. I can't get home. Um, I don't have a card. I don't have the money to take a, a Lyft or an Uber or a taxi. Um, they really start looking at resource allocation and also a little bit of mental health, like are we about to discharge her back into a violent home? And maybe she needs some therapy. And so the social service is responsible for a lot of things, but investigating someone who says something strange is not their job. Psychiatric service. Remember, it's psychiatric-mental health. So these professionals are responsible for interviewing and working up patients who may be psychotic or have psychiatric diagnoses or also may have a variety of mental health disorders. Things like depression, for example, uh, needing to talk to a therapist. And so working up this patient who says, well, I might just kill my husband, right? So if you really want to get it down to easy, when do you call psych versus social service? When the patient is psycho, right? That's when you call psych. They say something really weird and off the wall, it's time to bring in psych to work this patient up. We've talked about the police and security, and now physical therapy versus occupational therapy. Remember that the primary work of physical therapy is strength training and rehabilitation. Strength training again, say you've had a knee replacement or rehabilitation, you've had a stroke, going to try to learn how to 
get out of the wheelchair and back onto the bed. Um, they do all this kinds of stuff. And occupational therapy is concerned more with fine motor skill development that lends itself toward occupations. So like being able to do building blocks and work with your fingers very finely or write your name again with a big kind of crayon pen or speech therapy as I talked about falls under occupational therapy where the swallow test is done, right? And by the way, if somebody fails their swallow test and they're in the ICU, um, but their vital signs are stable, O2 sat is good, they're awake, alert, oriented, and talking to you, but they failed their swallow test. Will they stay in the ICU or will they go to the step down? And the answer, unfortunately, is they will go to the step down to aspirate and come back, right? But you can't just keep a patient in the ICU. The only issue they had was they failed their swallow test. If they're neurologically intact, they go out to step down. So there are many issues regarding access to care. And our four big players here about where would you send your patient? Do they need home health? Do they need hospice? Do they need a sniff? Do they need private duty? We will look at each of these. In addition to accessing the healthcare system on behalf of your patient and navigating that system, uh, issues regarding access to care, it's very important here about hmm, where would you send your patient? What kind of care does your patient need, say, after hospitalization? Uh, this will be tested, so you want to be very clear on the picture of each of these models of care and to make a choice that's based on how much care you need for the patient, okay? So the first I'll talk about is home health. And generally today, of course, very different from back in the day, we send people home as soon as possible to save money. And we make patients take care of themselves or we make the family take care of them because it's just cheaper. Uh, what happens is then about three times a week, a home health nurse will come by the home, usually with the badge, same badge from the hospital, hi, I'm the home health nurse, and they come in and do an assessment. And sometimes they find patients awake and talking to you, but sitting in their recliner with no blood pressure, and so back to the hospital we go. I mean, these nurses really intervene in some great places. Um, and find some messes when they get there, but hopefully it goes well. Um, their job is to check in, do an assessment. However, the work is very limited, meaning they come in, they check the vital signs, uh, say they've had a knee replacement, they're gonna do some suture care on that knee, they're gonna want to ask the patient about pain management, are you taking anything? They're gonna wanna watch the patient walk on their walker a little bit around the house, ask about food, is somebody preparing something for you or bringing something for you? Do you need anything? Do you want me to set you up for your bath today? Okay, well, if not, here's the card for the office. And if you need anything, call and uh, somebody will answer and I'll see you in a couple of days. It is a very short, focused visit. And I will tell you that they're, they're scheduled about one an hour and that includes some drive time between one house to another. So somebody, some nurse is gonna be there 17 to 20 something minutes max, and then they have to go chart everything in their car, on their laptop, or their iPad, or their Surface, and off to the next visit they go. So again, not being critical of home health nurses, they have a huge contribution, but if you need more than what I call a drive-by visit of a nurse in the house for about 20 minutes, then do not recommend that that's all your patient needs, all right? They're gonna need a higher level of care. Hospice, a couple of things here. You must meet the criteria of hospice and that is to have a death diagnosis of less than six months and only be receiving comfort measures. So if they're getting antibiotics, that's not necessarily a comfort measure that is um, gonna be treating the patient. Although I'll tell you on the sideline, 
Some hospices offer that as a possibility, but Tylenol, um, you know, basic fluids, and if they stop drinking, they stop drinking. The only time for IV fluids would be to give pain medicine if really needed. Um, and so it's supportive care to be as comfortable as the patient can be uh, at the end of life, okay? So again, just because you have a cancer diagnosis does not qualify one for hospice. A skilled nursing facility. Well, this looks kind of like a nursing home, and it probably used to be, um, where, you know, there are, uh, the patients go there right out of the hospital who need more rehabilitation, and that's one of the advantages to SNFs. They're going to go down to rehab a couple of times a day, physical therapy specifically, and do strength training. So, say an elder had um, a spinal fusion. They get him out of the hospital within a day or so and they go to the sniff and he has to learn how to maneuver with the back brace and strength train again before he's just sent home to take care of himself, all right? So it is a higher level of care. And remember in general, and I think this is important to remember, the inability to perform your activities of daily living is really the implication and indication for sending somebody to a sniff, If you can't do it yourself at home, uh, and by that I mean not just give yourself a sponge bath, but get around and you're gonna need a good bit of, of rehab and physical therapy, that's where you go. Being unable to do your activities of daily living is really what you're looking for, for this to be an appropriate referral. And then private duty, just remember it's a very expensive model. Do you have $25 or $35 an hour for a nurse to sit at the bedside of your family member and take care? That's around $700 a day of expendable cash. And so it's a very expensive model and it is not often used. Palliative care. What is it? A multidisciplinary approach intended to improve quality of life of patients and their families facing a life-threatening illness through the provision and relief of suffering. The key elements of palliative care include early identification, impeccable assessment, and treatment of pain and other problems, be they physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. It includes incorporating a multidisciplinary team, the skills of physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, dietitians, social workers, psychologists, chaplains, massage therapists, among other people. And remember to ascertain if the patient has an advanced directive to guide potential future decisions about palliative care. So you say, okay, we're gonna send, set this guy up for palliative care. Well, before you even get the ball rolling, you're going to need to know and assess. Does he have an advance directive uh, or not? Maybe we need one in place so that we can make good decisions about to what extent uh, we're going to need palliative care. And I also think that it's very important to distinguish palliative care from hospice. Palliative care and hospice both provide comfort. Palliative care can begin at diagnosis and at the same time as treatment. Hospice begins after treatment is stopped and when it's determined that the patient will not survive an illness. Healthcare financing, and we need to uh, really be keen on this beyond just coding, using the evaluation and management E&M codes to identify level of care that's provided. Of course, the more codes one has, the bigger the bill. But understanding more about billing, reimbursement, and third-party payers, you will see that on your exam. So let's talk a minute about that. There are numerous categories of third-party payers, and I have fi five of them, for example, here on the slide. The first one is a highlight, Medicare. Medicare, by the way, Medicaid, commercial indemnity insurers, commercial management organizations like HMOs, and even businesses or schools wanting health service for employees or students, these are third-party payers. Medicare sets the standard for reimbursement and controlling costs, and I would remember that. So let's say that Medicare pays $20,000 for a knee replacement, 
the hospital will get reimbursed that amount, 80% actually of that amount, and if it costs, you know, 24000 48000 100000 the hospital has to eat that money. And so getting patients out of the hospital is important for a lot of reasons, but money drives the picture. Medicaid we'll talk about in a second, and again, I've listed the others. What about being able to appropriately uh, document the appropriate physical exam? What level is it to determine levels of EM services? So take a review of these four. There's problem focused where there's a limited exam of an affected body area or organ system. There's an expanded problem focused, a limited exam of the affected body area or organ system and any other symptomatic or related body areas or organ systems. Detailed an extended examination of the affected body areas or organ systems and any other symptomatic or related body areas or organ systems. And then there's a comprehensive, a general multi-system exam or complete exam of a single organ system and other symptomatic or related areas or organ systems. So the two I think that are the closest together, obviously, what's the difference in an expanded problem focused and a detailed? Let me give you two patients from my past. First of all, if you are assessing um, sinusitis that also involves patient, the patient coughing, that's two systems. You're going to do EENT and you're going to do the respiratory system. So that would be an expanded problem focused. A problem focused might be taking out sutures. It might be going over medications. Something that is focused and, and simple, if you will, it's limited is a better word. Well, what about the difference in a detailed versus the others? What if you have multi-body systems like you have a woman uh, and she is having some pelvic pain? Well, you have got to, by the way, a pap smear is in the scope of practice for the acute care nurse practitioner, and I would remember that. You can get you a job where you don't have to do it, but it is in the scope of practice. So you have a patient, say, on the floor who's having some pelvic pain. That is going to be a GYN exam, a GU, and a GI. You've got three systems to assess there, and that will be a detailed assessment and documentation. And then comprehensive, we rarely have to worry about because the patient would not be on the floor or in the ICU if they did not have a complete history and physical exam exam uh, documented. You can't get admitted past the ED. So uh, again, I would pay attention to expanded problem focused and detailed and be able to differentiate between the two. You must be clear about the types of Medicare and what is covered under each. Medicare A is the one we're all supposed to get at 65 years of age if there's any money left. And this covers inpatient, hospitalization, skilled nursing facility services, home health services, and or hospice associated with being in the inpatient setting. So uh, let's say, again, let's use that guy with the spinal fusion. He's 73, so his surgery and such will be covered in Medicare A as well as his SNF and his home health that were related to that surgery. Medicare B covers physician services and that's where nurse practitioners come in and I would remember that under Medicare B. It also includes outpatient hospital services, labs and diagnostic procedures, medical equipment, and some home health services. It is supplemental medical insurance requiring recipients to pay a premium. So again, it is not free uh, per se. And these two points here are very important. NPs and CNSs receive 85% of physician reimbursement for services provided in collaboration with the physician. However, 
Remember that Medicare pays 80% of the patient's bill for physician services and the patient pays 20%. Again, Medicare only pays 80% to a physician or a nurse practitioner or anybody. The patient pays the rest. So what happens if you've got that $20,000 bill for the knee replacement, the patient's gonna have to come up with four grand. And how do people do that? Well, as one gets older, you begin to do stuff like take out an AARP supplement so that if the time comes that you need some money to pay, you'll have it. Medicare C, I like to refer to as A plus B equals C. It was formerly known as Medicare plus choice and now no, is known as Medicare Advantage. Um, essentially, patients are entitled to Medicare C uh, if they were enrolled in Medicare A and B. Uh, they're eligible for this privilege, and this privilege involves being able to pick your provider or your provider organization, such as an HMO or PPO uh, of your choice that's on the list. Medicare D, remember, limited prescription drug coverage. It's drugs. Um, plans offered by insurance and other private companies are approved by Medicare. It requires a monthly premium and a copay on each prescription. So again, if your Crest store is a $40 copay, it is here as well. So it's not completely free. Um, there's one of the reasons people are still rolling up on the ramp with their strokes, not taking their meds. They can't afford their meds. So we have something in place better than nothing, but it still requires patients to pay. And there's also a penalty that may be applicable if one is not enrolled when they be first become eligible. Um, assistance is available for people with limited income and resources as well. So which two forms of Medicare require the patient to pay something? The answer is D and B. Medicare rules for NPs. To qualify to be a Medicare provider and therefore be reimbursed, as you know, we're not paid as nurse practitioners, we are reimbursed as nurse practitioners, a little play on words. One must hold a state license as a nurse practitioner, be certified as a nurse practitioner by a recognized national certifying body, and hold at least a master's degree. So these have to be in place before somebody can actually be a Medicare provider as a nurse practitioner. Then a reminder again on the next slide about Medicare payments that I just said, but very important to remember. Medicare reimburses NPs 85% of the physician fee delineated in Medicare's physician fee schedule. So, I don't know, if something, a physician was going to get $100, then the nurse practitioner will get $85. For a procedure, Medicare pays NPs 80% of the 85% of the physician fee scheduled rate. So again, it has to do with the fact that Medicare only pays 80% regardless if you are a nurse practitioner or a physician. And yet, practices must bill under the provider of the clinician who performs a given service. And the exception is incident to billing. When billing incident to a physician service, you have a practice that may be reimbursed 100% of the physician's scheduled rate. And I'll get to that in a second. But again, like only one of you, the physician or the nurse practitioner, can bill for those morning rounds. And you have to decide. Uh, again, if you go to the hospital, you're in internal medicine, you make rounds, the doctor never comes, then you bill 85% of what he or she could have received. However, if the doctor comes and follows you and signs your chart and says, agree with the above, John Smith, MD, why are they doing that? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, remember, you never have to be co-signed by a physician nothing your prescriptions your your progress notes your discharge notes and that makes us quite different from pas the reason the physician is doing that is because he can prove that he quote saw the patient 
and therefore 100% of the physician fee comes to the practice because only one of you can bill for that event. Um, and we've seen this all the time in the ICUs where the attending comes by, looks through the glass, and signs off on the chart. Has no idea what's going on, but the fellows, the attendings, the nurse practitioners have you know written the notes in the chart. But if he can show that he saw the physician, that he was there, that he saw the patient, then 100% can come into the practice. What about incident to the physician billing? So. When you are independently billing, you are obviously billing under your nurse practitioner number. But incident two billing involves billing under the physician's provider number to give full physician fee 100% back to the practice. I go into this in quite a bit of detail here. Um, I'm going to try to summarize it for you as, little, as best I can. The services are an integral, although incidental, part of the physician's professional service, commonly rendered without charge or included in the physician's bill, but some other things count too. They are of a type commonly furnished in physician's offices or clinics, furnished under the physician's direct personal supervision, and are furnished by the physician or by an individual who is an employee or independent contractor of the physician. Direct supervision does not require the physician's presence in the same room, but the physician must be present in the same office suite and immediately available. So for example, you're in a room and you're in an internal medicine practice you're in one room, the doc is in the other room, you, you pick up a little hypertension, you go get the doc, the doc comes in and initiates the plan of care. Hello, how are you? I want you to go home for a month of therapeutic lifestyle changes and everybody goes home. A month later, the patient comes back to the practice. You can continue the plan of care and bill 100% under the physician's provider number as long as the physician, again, is in the same office suite. So he didn't have to be in the same room, but he's got to be there. So like down the hall, seeing another patient, in the bathroom, in his office, the rule is that he has to be immediately available for direct consultation, okay? Number two on the slide, the physician must perform the initial service and subsequent services of a frequency which reflect his or her active participation in the management of a course of treatment. The physician or other provider under whose name and number the bill is submitted must be the individual present in the office suite when the service is provided. So for example, if you have a satellite clinic and you also have the main office downtown and you know both offices are billing 100 percent one at two o'clock and one at 205 there is where medicare fraud is unraveled because obviously the physician cannot be in two places within five minutes of each other so somebody is billing without the physician being present number four is a highlight then incident to billing is not allowed in the hospital setting an NP must bill under his or her provider number. Again, this is only, uh, this is only pertinent in the office setting. So, and another note about that office setting, again, he must be there or she must be there. They cannot be available by cell phone, on the golf course, on vacation in Tahiti or whatever. And an NP may bill for an assistance work like performing an EKG under the NP's provider number as long as the rules for incident to billing are followed. Well, what about other rules for billing? I've already mentioned the first one. Physicians and NPs may see a patient on the same day for their service. However, the two must coordinate billing to avoid duplicate payments. For inpatients, physicians and NPs must decide for which party, again, the NP or the physician, which one should bill given the amount of services rendered by each on a given day. For home NP visits that are billable for Medicare A services, NPs do not need a physician's order to bill under the NP's provider number. 
unless the MP is providing nursing services exclusively. So that's usually not why an NP would be visiting anyway. You'd just have a nurse visit. Why do you need an NP? In contrast, Medic Aid, Medicare cares for the elderly, Medic Aid aids the poor. It is a federally supported state administered program for low income families and individuals. The benefits vary from state to state. There's one. No other form of reimbursement do the benefits vary from state to state. Medicare payments are made after other insurance or third party payments have been made. Case management. You need to know here, um, obviously, a little bit about what is what is involved and what's its purpose. It involves a comprehensive and systematic approach to provide quality care. And important to remember, what is the purpose of case management? To mobilize, monitor, and control resources that a patient uses during a course of illness while balancing quality and cost. So if we didn't have these fine, you know, women and men running around, tapping on their clipboards, why is the patient still here? Why is the patient still here? Then people would just get stuck in the cracks and they would wind up staying on the step down unit forever and, you know, not moving along in the healthcare system. Very important. I have almost an entire page on quality assurance, QA, QI, and it may be referred to as CPI in practice as well as on your test. I would know the theory of this extremely well, and I would be shocked if you did not have a question or two on safety, quality, improving quality, etc. So first of all, what is it? A management process of monitoring, evaluating, continuous review, and improving the quality in providing health care. With regard to quality assurance, this process, it is a process again for evaluating the care of patients and using established standards of care to ensure quality. In theory, it is based on methodology developed by Deming and tested in Japanese industry that quality can be improved by continually monitoring structure, process, and outcome standards known as CQI. Uh, continuous quality improvement. It involves structures, processes of care, and outcomes as well. Structures involve inputs into care such as resources, equipment, or numbers and qualifications of staff. Processes of care include assessments, planning, performing treatments, and managing complications. And outcomes include complications, adverse events, short-term results of treatment, and long-term results of patient health and functioning. Four, yeah, quality assurance is used to assess, monitor again, and improve care provided to patients. The components include monitoring of care quality, care appropriateness, effectiveness of care, cost of care, self-regulation, and peer review to ensure compliance to care standards. Quality and Safety Education for Nurses, QSIN initiative, is a part of Quality Assurance, and it is an initiative that, that is aimed at providing future nurses with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary to ensure continuous improvement in quality and safety of their respective health care systems. CUSIN identifies, funds, and promotes education across six key competencies, and I would know these very well. Patient-centered care, teamwork and collaboration, evidence-based practice, EBI, QI, safety, and informatics. Steps of CQI or QA are outlined by the Joint Commission. And quality planning, that is developing a quality management plan, which assigns responsibility for the degree of involvement, is a big component. These steps delineate scope of care, and they look very much like the nursing process, like such, such things as identify important aspects of care, identify indicators related to those aspects of care, establish thresholds for evaluation, 
collect and organize data, evaluate care when thresholds are reached, take action to improve the care, assess the effectiveness of the action and document improvement, and communicate relevant information. It also may well involve a critical path. The critical path contains key patient care activities and timeframes for those activities, which are needed for a specific case type or DRG, diagnostic related group. In other words, you shouldn't be in the hospital more than two days with a basic knee replacement unless there's complications. A care map, of course, is a newer version of the critical path, and it is a blueprint for planning and managing care delivered by all disciplines. So it's multidisciplinary. And the care map contains a critical path section plus a section that identifies common problems encountered by patients of a specific case type, the day-to-day -day goals that the patient must achieve, and the final desired clinical outcomes. Again, monitoring of outcomes of care is a very important part of QA, QI, CPI. Root cause analysis, this is a highlight, a tool for identifying prevention strategies to ensure safety. It is a process that is part of the effort to build a culture of safety and move beyond a culture of blame. Keep that in mind. It is a process that is a part of an effort to build a culture of safety rather than a culture of blame. But I can tell you, somebody's going down, right? I mean, that's really where they're going to go with this. We've got to figure out where did it happen. And it involves and incorporates, again, interdisciplinary experts from the frontline services, those who are the most familiar with the situation, continually digging deeper by asking why, why, why at each level of cause and effect, and identifying changes that need to be made to systems. Again, a process that is as impartial as possible is important too. I have to say that as a businessman, I use this all the time in my company. And when something goes wrong, I will go straight to the people who are most at the front line of the potential issue and ask, why did that happen? And 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 just keep digging. I mean, people don't want to get their colleagues in trouble, but they also don't want to lie to the boss. And I can tell you that it may take a while, but if you keep asking why, you will get to the actual root cause of the issue. Central events, unexpected occurrences involving death or serious physical or psychological injury or the risk thereof. Serious injury specifically includes death, permanent harm, or severe temporary harm, among others. Notice the phrase, or the risk thereof, includes any process variation for which a recurrence would carry a significant chance of a serious adverse outcome. Mm. Maybe like, you know, leaving a sponge in a patient and then sewing them up in the OR. Such events are called sentinel because they signal the need for immediate investigation and response. But remember that the terms sentinel event and medical error are not synonymous. Not all sentinel events occur because of an error and not all errors result in sentinel events. In response to a sentinel events, for example, falls in a nursing home or a colleague's behavior that undermines a culture of safety, clinicians and institutions are expected to conduct a root cause analysis. So these two are very closely related. And now part four, professional responsibility. We start with a question. As a hospitalist, a nurse approaches you and says, please come help us. We're really short staffed today and we need to get this LP done right away. As you enter the room, you notice that the patient is a male who is approximately 12 years old. You decide to step out of the room to discuss things with the nurse. What is your best response? And of course, hopefully you picked D, call the pediatrician immediately. This is out of scope.
for the adult GERO acute care nurse practitioner. Okay, you can do an LP, but not on a 12 year old. So A, is he neurologically intact? C, how high is his temperature? Has he had any seizure activity? Very gossipy, right? I mean, we're really getting into details that have not way beyond the scope of practice, okay? And B is not appropriate. I'm not really sure how to do this. You need to call the doctor. Do not tell somebody that you do not know what you're doing. Of course they need to call the doctor, but they need to call the appropriate doctor, which is a pediatrician. So again, let this be an example of a good question. Call the right person, make the right referrals, and do not step out of your scope of practice in your practice or on the exam. So scope of practice is based on legal allowances in each state according to and delineated by individual state nurse practice acts. Where are these state nurse practice acts? They are housed at the individual state boards of nursing. And they provide guidelines for nursing practice. Again, they vary from state to state. The state practice acts authorize boards of nursing in each state to establish statutory authority for licensure of registered nurses, as well as nurse practitioners. And that authority includes the use of title, authorization of scope of authority, including prescriptive authority and disciplinary grounds. So it's the state practice acts that again are housed at the state board of nursing with regard to prescriptive authority the ability and extent of the mp's ability to prescribe meds to patients is dependent on the state nurse practice acts and notice that while the dea has ruled that nurses in advanced practice may obtain registration numbers the state practice acts dictate the level of prescriptive authority that's actually allowed so we still have numerous states who are struggling with complete prescriptive authority. Most states, but not all states, can prescribe through Schedule II. Um, we still have a long way to go. Credentials, licensure, and certification. Be sure you're clear about the difference in these three. Credentials encompass your required education, your licensure, and your certification to practice as a nurse practitioner. So credentials, that's the whole bag there, your education, your license, and your certification. And credentials establish minimal levels of acceptable performance. You need to know why credentialing is necessary, as well as the other three points here. Credentialing is necessary to ensure that safe health care is provided by qualified individuals, to comply with federal and state laws relating to advanced nursing practice. They, credentials acknowledge the scope of practice of the NP. Credentials mandate accountability and credentials enforce professional standards for practice. Licensure establishes that a person is simply qualified to perform a particular professional role. And a licensure is granted as defined by rules and regulations set forth by a governmental agency, namely the State Board of Nursing. That is where you get your license from as an RN, and that's where you will get your license from as a nurse practitioner. In contrast, certification establishes that a person has met certain standards in a particular profession which signify mastery of specialized knowledge and skill. And as we talked about in the opening when I first met you, I said this is a mastery exam, it is not a familiarity exam, and that's exactly what we mean here. The RN will say there are ST changes, or maybe there's ST elevation. The nurse practitioner will say 2, 3, and AVF is inferior mastery and yet note that certification is granted by non-governmental agencies and for our group it is the ANCC or the AACN admitting privileges to hospitals non-physician providers were granted the possibility of hospital staff membership 
1983 by the Joint Commission. So this has not been a forever privilege. What about credentialing and privileging, and sometimes we use these words interchangeably, but a little different. The process by which an NP is granted permission to practice in an inpatient setting is deemed credentialing and privileging. Credentialing with hospital privileges is granted by a hospital credentialing committee, not the State Board of Nursing, which is comprised of physicians who hold privileges at that given hospital where the NP has made the request. Sometimes there may be an NP on that committee, sometimes a PA, the vast majority are physicians who already have privileges in that hospital. And privileges may be granted in part or full. Stipulations regarding the allowance of future privileges may be made by the credentialing committee, like the number of additional supervised hours required before a certain privilege is granted. So you might have admitting privileges, discharge privileges, but if you want to do invasive procedures, that would be another hurdle. Different institutions have different levels that they can grant as they watch your performance and also they assess your QA, your QI, and your charts. Patient medical abandonment results when the caregiver-patient relationship is terminated without making reasonable arrangements with an appropriate person so that care can be provided by others and continued. The determination, though, of patient abandonment may depend on many factors, and I list three of them here for you. Whether the practitioner accepted the patient assignment, uh, which formally created a practitioner-patient relationship, whether the practitioner provided reasonable notice before terminating the practitioner-patient relationship, and whether reasonable arrangements could have been made to continue patient care when the adequate notification was given. Risk management. A systematic effort to reduce risk begins with a formal written risk management plan that includes the organization's goals, a delineation of the program scope, components, and methods, delegating responsibility for implementation and enforcement, and guarantees confidentiality and immunity from retaliation for those who report sensitive information. Incident reports are the most common method of documentation for risk management. And yet, satisfaction surveys are also important as well. They're an important form, if you will, uh, for identifying problems before developing into actual incidents or claims. And important to track and analyze just like incident reports. So, Pretty much, somebody says something or calls the hospital, I'm never coming back to this place again. None of my family will ever be back. Well, that person's angry, and we're going to have to have a meeting to calm this down to figure out the problem. Um, and again, satisfaction surveys include patient satisfaction surveys as well as employee and or practitioner satisfaction surveys. Complaints, finally, are a key source of potential risk management information. A risk management plan should delineate tracking, analyzing, and managing all complaints. Action taking initiatives of risk management include prevention, correction, documentation, education, and then departmental coordination. Medical futility refers to interventions that are unlikely to produce any significant benefit for the patient. Does the intervention have any reasonable prospect of helping this patient? Um, there are two kinds of medical futility that are often distinguished, and you need to know these. Quantitative futility and qualitative futility. Quantitative futility, the number where the likelihood that an intervention will benefit the patient is extremely poor. So unfortunately, for a brain tumor, how many surgeries do we do? How many craniotomies? One. Because what is the truth about a brain tumor? The person's going to die. It's just a matter of a year and a half or so, right? Well, that's most people. But um, what do we know? Well. You can go back and do craniotomy after craniotomy, but the outcome is still going to be the same. Um, think about a brain tumor. 
It's like an octopus. It has a head and then it has phalanges kind of st extending down into the brain tissue. So you take off the octopus head and you close the patient up and then they take chemo to try to destroy the rest of it. But eventually those phalanges are going to, to grow another octopus head. And this goes on and on and on. So that quantitative futility would be a question of the number of interventions that are, that are just really not going to make a difference in the end. Where qualitative futility, where the quality of benefit an intervention will produce is extremely poor. And again, the quality. So let's go back to the brain tumor patient. You already have the craniotomy and now it's a year out and they've had some chemo and so forth, but they begin to lose uh, sight in their eye. They have half vision or they begin to slur their speech or their motor skills begin to decline. The cranial nerves are being encroached. And so it becomes a question of quality of life. It, it, we can do another surgery, but you're still going to lose consciousness or not have difficulty swallowing or whatever. And so quantitative is the number and qualitative is the quality question. As the hospitalist AGA CMP, you're called at 5.45 a.m. because the patient is confused and he refuses to go to surgery for a carotid endarterectomy. You ascertain that an informed consent was signed the previous day. What should you do? A. Refer the patient to a neurology service for a workup prior to surgery. B. Cancel the procedure. C. Have the wife sign the consent. Or D. Clarify in the chart that the patient was not confused when he signed the consent. Which of these is the best answer? The answer is D. And again, get in charge of the patient. So refer to somebody else is not the right answer for A. An informed consent is be a legally binding document between the patient and caregiver or institution. So the wife is not in the loop here. This has to do the patient must be informed and must give consent. We wouldn't cancel the procedure because you may need the OR faster than you thought. That's a very nursey answer if you picked that. You need to get back in the role of the MP and not just the nurse on this test. But the bottom line is that when somebody has an informed consent and then they have a change in their behavior or their attitude is completely different, they're not themselves, they won't go or whatever, you just need to make sure that they were of sound mind and competent when they signed and then carry on with the procedure. So let's look at this a little more closely. Informed consent. There must be competence, that is decisional capability. And that is a state in which a patient is able to make personal decisions about his or her care. Differentiate good and bad and communicate. So they must be able to do all those to be competent and have decisional capability understand, reason, differentiate good and bad, and communicate. Informed consent. A state indicating that a patient has received adequate instruction or information regarding aspects of care to make a prudent personal choice regarding such treatment. And it includes discussion of all of the benefits and risks with the patient in order to make a truly informed decision. And generally, consent is assumed if the patient's condition is life-threatening. So one of the things that doesn't go so well is patients are not always to uh, told all the risks that are there. They're saying, you gotta have surgery because we really gotta fix this thing. And sometimes physicians don't always tell them, including death. So I always remind people when getting informed consent, I don't care if you've taken off a toenail, be sure to include the possibility of death because it's true. Anything could happen and something could go really bad, no matter how careful you are. The right to refuse care. Does a patient have a right to refuse care? Indeed, they do. And they must be advised at the time of their admission to a federally funded institution, such as a hospital, nursing home, hospice, HMO, that they have a right to refuse care. And this was set forth by the Danforth Amendment. What care can be refused? The answer is any of it, some of it, or all of it. 
as long as the patient has decisional capability and that is competence. Ethical principles. Well, first of all, what is ethics, right? The study of moral conduct and behavior which serves to govern conduct, thereby protecting the rights of an individual. Let's practice a question. An AGACMP is about to give a deposition as a defense witness involving another NP and the hospital. Just before testifying, the hospital's chief medical officer approaches the AGACMP and quietly states, now I just want to remind you to remember that as an employee of this hospital, you know that we expect all of your answers to always lean toward the side of those who pay your salary. Okay? I'm sure you understand. I'm sure you'll do just fine. Which two ethical principles are in conflict for this NP? Veracity and what? The answer is B, fidelity. And uh, I think this is an excellent example of a question I wrote to say, be ready for an ethical dilemma or two. And when we talk about ethics, as you see on this slide, there's a scale. On one hand, this, but on the other hand, that. So it's always weighing the positives and the negatives. If we look at back at that previous question, veracity is, of course, the duty to be truthful and fidelity is the duty to be faithful. So they are in conflict in this question. They want you to lie if you have to, to cover the hospital. So this is an issue, but you also want to be faithful to your boss who pays your salary. So the conflict then is between the two. So look for the opposite. On one hand, this, and on the other hand, that. There are seven key ethical principles. Know these cold. Non-maleficence is the duty to do no harm, whereas look at beneficence, number three, is the duty to prevent harm and promote good. Utilitarianism is the right act, states that the right act is the one that produces the greatest good for the greatest number. All right, so this would be like a mass casualty event here. Who are the most salvageable people? When we talk about uh, war times, for example, the critically ill patients may well die anyway. We talk about a natural disaster like a tornado hitting a hospital. Well, yeah, and this has happened in our own country where you know, a nurse or two stay in the ICU to listen for alarms and all the other nurses go down to the emergency department because you've got to help those people coming to the hospital or they're all going to die. So they're bleeding, they, you know, have a head injury, they're going to die too. The critical care people may die anyway, but if you don't help the masses coming in for the mass event, the mass casualty event, they're going to die too. So it's the greatest good for the greatest number is how this is weighed. As I mentioned, beneficence is the duty to prevent harm and promote good. Uh, justice is the duty to be fair. Fidelity is the duty to be faithful. And autonomy. Autonomy is the duty to respect an individual's thoughts and actions. A man has a right to make his own decisions. I do not want to be on any more chemotherapy or radiation. I know I'm going to die, but I am tired of living this way. A man has a right, or a woman certainly, to make that decision. Let's have another question. A 94-year-old experienced a massive basospastic CVA. His prognosis is grim and he has no advanced directive. While not on a ventilator, he remains unresponsive. Labs continue to show early signs of malnutrition and nutritional support is discussed with the family. The wife states that she wants everything done, while the daughter states he'd never want to be on a feeding tube to keep him alive. What should you do?
the best answer, and really the only answer, is A, call the ethics committee. So look for an ethics committee question, but again, is there a legally binding document? No, otherwise you wouldn't need an ethics committee if you had an informed consent. We talked about that. But you've got two family members that have a different opinion of what should happen to the husband and his father. And we're going to have to do something or he's going to die because you see that in the labs. Uh, so you really want the family to be happy with that decision, okay? And yet, if you're not able to really talk to them and get it together with them, there's confliction. I mean, what the patient would want, what the family would want, and particularly in this case, you've got two family members who want different things. That is a time to bring in the ethics committee. And of course, who's on the ethics committee? I mean, there's a physician, usually perhaps a nurse practitioner or at least a nurse, clergy, psychologist, sometimes there's an attorney, uh, somebody from the community is usually on this, a social worker, and they come together and they weigh uh, basically the odds of making which decision and then approach the family uh, in a different way, kind of using uh, an ethical approach. So consulting neurology and have them do the interview is punting again. You must be in the driver's seat and making decisions on this test in your practice. We certainly would not chart it and just hope for the best and put in a G-tube, I hope. Um, it doesn't really matter that the wife is next of kin. You've got a situation where the daughter doesn't like this, and so you think she's just going to go along with a G-tube because the wife wants things done? No. And again, don't call the clergy in this situation either. What about dismissing or discharging a patient from your practice? Can you do that? Certainly. And how about closing a practice? You can certainly do that. If your patient is not being compliant uh, and you've done all you can do, then it's time to move on. And, uh, you know, not only can you do that with a patient, you can do it with your physician, dentist. I've done it with a dentist before. I'm like, this relationship is over. I felt like he was abusive to the staff. And I could just, I was all anxious just to go for a cleaning. He's yelling in the place. I'm like, I had to get out of here. So you can just say we're done. But an NP cannot withdraw from caring for a patient without notification. So again, examples of reasons for discharging include abuse from the patient, refusal to pay for services, or again, patients' non-adherence to recommended care. I talk a little bit more in detail in the manual about steps for discharging a patient for, from the practice. I'll highlight a couple. You need to send a certified letter with return receipt and keep a copy in the chart saying that you're discharging, dismissing, or maybe you're just closing your practice, you're moving across the country. The content of the letter should be general versus specific. You should provide general health care coverage for two weeks to a month after this termination deadline, if needed, and obtain release of information to provide copies of all needed records for subs the subsequent care provider. Obligations in closing a practice due to relocation, retirement, or similar. Give the patient adequate time again. Keep all files for a minimum of five years. Follow your state laws regarding differences in uh, storage requirements. And to avoid complaints of patient abandonment, provide timely notification and names of other providers and resources for future care. History of the nurse practitioner role. Who were the first nurse practitioners? The answer, pediatrics. Yep, that was the first specialty back in the 1960s, and um, it was a result of physician shortage in the area of peds. And the first program was a pediatric program again, 1964 by Dr. Loretta Ford and Dr. Henry Silver, the University of Colorado. She is a nurse practitioner. He is the physician who started this. And the short story was that everybody who was working in peds, the nurses, all wanted to stay in Denver. One major city in the entire state, and nobody wanted to go out to the surrounding uh, you know, counties and smaller cities to provide care to kids. 
And so Dr. Silver said, let me give some additional training to some of these nurses so that they can go out there and meet those needs. And it was interesting that not everybody signed up for that because nurses said, I didn't want to be a doctor, that's why I'm a nurse. And so there was a real call for help and it wasn't strongly responded to. And that's how PA programs actually evolved because nurses didn't want to do it. And today we have NPs and PAs. Growth of NP programs soon ensued with distribution of NPs in various practice settings, initially with an emphasis on ambulatory and outpatient care. And they still are our largest number of nurse practitioners. But the historical service of MPs in primary care resulted in part from the availability of federal funding for preventative and primary care education. Number five and six are star highlights. Movement MPs, though, expanded to the inpatient setting as a result of managed care, hospital restructuring, and decreases in medical residency programs. I can tell you that the acute care role flourished once they limited the number of hours that a physician could actually work a shift in a hospital, and we were able to step in as intensivists or hospitalists and meet that need. And now we have NP hospitalists, NP intensivists, uh, NPs running nursing homes, extended care facilities, SNFs, and all of this was kind of e has kind of evolved through the years. But you need to know the theory of how did it first expand. And there are four distinct roles of the nurse practitioner. And although these words could be changed slightly, you need to know them. Clinician consultant, collaborator, educator, and researcher. So most people pop out of a nurse practitioner program feeling pretty good about their knowledge base as a clinician. I saw myself as a collaborator. I don't know that I thought, thought I was that much of a consultant as a new nurse practitioner. Certainly, I, I felt like my job was to educate patients and staff. But the one I felt the absolute worst at was researcher, and I have a feeling I'm not alone. So if research was not your best and strongest suit, pay attention here for the next 10 minutes as we run through principles of evidence-based practice and research methods. Again, this may not be your favorite subject line, but you're going to need to know this for the exam, and more importantly, you're going to need to know it for your practice. How do you know that you need to change your practice? You have to have basic knowledge of research. So let's practice this question first. Which of these is most important to consider with regard to statistical significance before implementing a new protocol in your practice from findings in a research article? A, B, C, or D. The answer is D, looking at the sample size. So the one thing I miss, those of you who are there in the online streaming course, is I miss being able to see you vote. It's like, okay, how many picked which answer? I can do that in the live course. Um, but I have a feeling not everybody got that. Looking at the sample size, how is that relevant? Well, the larger the sample size, the more robust your findings. If only three or four of you actually voted on your clicker ABCD, then why, if I got 150 people in the ballroom, why am I even doing this? The more people who vote, the more it tells me about what everybody's thinking. And the same is true when you look at research. The larger the sample size, the more robust your findings, okay? All of these sound good, listen to this determining the error rate, making sure it has a tight confidence interval, testing to see if the p-value is less than the alpha, right? All oh, that sounds good and they are professional distractors. So if you missed it, get with it. We've got to soak in here and let's get started. So here are the 11 major steps in the research process. Question. Where does the nurse practitioner participate in any of these steps? And the answer is anywhere or all of them. 
You might be the person who formulates the research problem, reviewing the literature, formulating the hypothesis, selecting the research design, identifying the population to be studied, specifying the methods of data collection, designing the study, conducting the study, analyzing the data, going over to the statistician, say, hey, what does all this mean, kind of a thing, and interpreting the results or even communicating the findings. So these are all the steps that really involve the research process. And the truth is that you can participate in just about any place you want. Well, on the exam, in your practice, we need to review types of research. If you're asked, what is the research design of this study? What is the methodology? What is the approach? We really have three broad categories that you recall non-experimental, experimental, and qualitative. Let's look at each more closely. With non-experimental designs, this includes two broad categories of research, descriptive and ex post facto or correlational research. Descriptive research aims to describe situations, experiences, and phenomena as they exist where ex post facto or correlational research examines relationships among variables. So the best example I can give you, think about ex post facto means in the past. And we're going to try to describe a situation that happened or is happening. And one of the best examples is a chart audit. You're going to pull the OR records from the last three months in a facility and you're going to look at sepsis rate by surgeon on an X, Y axis. So there's not going to be any manipulation of variables or anything, but you're going to check it out. And you're going to see, for example, that Dr. Jones has a 3.2% sepsis rate as an orthopedic surgeon, whereas all the other surgeons are less than 0.5%. So you use this work by saying, hey, Dr. Jones, uh, what do you think the problem is here? You have the same ORs in the same hospital with the same nurses, and your sepsis rate is two and a half times higher than everybody else's. So what do you think the problem is here, Dr. Jones? That's how you use a non-experimental design. Now, other possibilities. It could have been a cross-sectional study again, that examines a population with very similar attributes like asthma, but they differ in one specific variable like age. It could have been a cohort study that compares a particular outcome in a group of individuals. So, for example, a cohort is a group. Uh, you are the graduating class from your school this year. That is the group. And if they send you an alumni survey, you want to fill that out. Until I became an administrator in a school of nursing, I didn't know how important that was. Your alma mater cannot get reaccredited without alumni data. So as a cohort, they're going to send you an alumni survey. Be sure you fill that out because no matter what your feelings are right now about your alma mater, it reflects you and you never would want your alma mater to lose their reaccreditation. The cohort will be tested this year. Well, what if they uh, email you next year and in three years? And they're, they're saying things like, they're going to ask you, did you pass your boards the first time? What's your practice setting like now? Um, what's your geographic area? What, you know, what, are you suburban? Are you inner city? Level one trauma center? So forth. They're collecting data. If they do this at year one, year three, and year five, what kind of study is that longitudinal? And it takes, again, involves multiple measures of that population over a period of time. That's non-experimental. An experimental design includes experimental manipulation of variables, utilizing two required things, randomization and a control group to test the effects of the intervention or the experiment that is known as RCTs, very important, randomized controlled trials. These are true experimental designs and often they're like double blind studies where nobody knows which pill is the placebo and which one is the new med 
and people are randomized into one of two groups. Well, what if you can't randomize or, um, you know, what if you can't have a control group? You can still do the experimental design, but that is called a quasi-experimental research. Again, it involves the manipulation of variables, but lacks either a comparison group or randomization. Qualitative research includes case studies, open-ended questions, field observations, participant observations, and ethnographic studies, where observation and interview techniques are used to explore phenomena through detailed descriptions of people, events, situations, or observed behavior. The lived experience of a 40-year-old dying of breast cancer. So we're going to interview like nine women who are 40 years old who are dying of breast cancer. And we're going to study these women. This is a qualitative study. I mean, there is no Likert scale to pass out to say, hey, can I measure this? You have to get it through interviews, for example. And you record your, the answers to your questions from each of your subjects. And you go home and you type it up. And then you start looking for themes that are equal or you think they are. Is that what they meant? Is this what they're saying? What, was, what is the worst thing about knowing that you're not going to make it? Uh, what has been the strongest deprivation that you've experienced since your diagnosis? Okay. So these three points really wrap up the mm, pros and cons of qualitative work. Researcher bias is a potential problem. Because you're not necessarily a 40-year-old dying of cancer, you could be biased because you're going to have to interpret what you think they meant. And, oh, this lady said about the same thing, and I think that's what this is. Secondly, the sample sizes are very small. Notice that I said nine. So there may be eight or nine subjects in the entire study. So this calls into question the generalizability of the findings. How can you say that the nine people that we select from your town really reflect the views of, again, Miami, New York, Minneapolis, D.C., etc.? We may, it may, it may not. But lastly, C, qualitative work produces very rich data through no other means of research. As I mentioned, if you really want to know what it's like, you really have to sit down and ask them. And that is a qualitative design. Level of evidence hierarchy. This is extremely important to conceptualize the highest level of evidence down to the lowest. And much of this makes sense, but let's run through it quickly. The highest level of incidence is a meta-analysis. Analyzing hundreds of studies, say, cardiovascular literature, for people who died of an MI or a CVA, right? And yet, if we really want to do a thorough meta-analysis, it is a meta-analysis of RCTs, randomized controlled trials, where again, that's your highest level of evidence because you're looking at lots of studies and they were randomized. The second level would be simple RCTs, not necessarily a meta-analysis, but again, RCTs are what kind of work? Quantitative designs. Quasi-experimental comes next, which lack randomization or a control group. Qualitative work comes next. Qualitative cohort studies, then case-controlled studies. And the lowest level of evidence is obviously an editorial or an expert opinion it is an opinion of one person. So be very strong in your ability to rank levels of evidence. Research terms. All of these are important for your understanding so that you can carry them into practice or delineate a question on the exam, whether it be the correct answer or a distractor. First of all, confidence interval is an interval which limits at either end with a specified probability of including the parameter being estimated. Notice that a small confidence interval implies a very precise range of values. So we like a very small confidence interval. Confidence interval of like 
about 2.8 to 3.2. Terminally ill bone cancer patients in the final stage of illness have between 2.8 and 3.2 episodes of nausea every 24 hours. It's very specific to have a small confidence interval. Standards, a standard deviation, what is it? Indicates the average amount of deviation of values from the mean. And so as we study subjects, you remember that about 68% of the sample falls within one standard deviation of the mean and 95% of the sample falls within two standard deviations of the mean. Level of significance. This is a highlight as well. Star, the probability level of which the results of statistical analyses are judged to indicate a statistically significant difference between two groups. Namely, and this is important, the probability of false rejection of the null hypothesis in a statistical test. False rejection. And level of significance, of course, remember, involves a p-value, L-M-N-O-P. P less than 0.05. That means the experimental and control groups are considered to be significantly different. Another way to kind of remember this, but it's kind of like street terms, there's more than a 95% chance of what you're seeing is not due to chance. Okay, does that make sense? A perfect correlation, and by the way, let me go back. So when you're reading a research piece in a journal, you want to look for a p-value. And then you want to look at the sample size because it, a p value means it was highly statistically significant. p equals 0 0.001 is a wow. Good. The next thing I want to see though is the sample size and I would like to know the type of research design before I make a judgment whether I want to take this article back to my practice and ask my colleagues do we want to change the way we do things. All right. That's how to use that p-value. A perfect correlation is a measure of the interdependence of two random values that range in value from negative 1 to plus 1. So negative 1 indicates a perfect negative correlation. 0 indicates an absence of correlation. And plus 1 indicates a perfect positive correlation. So notice that a p-value is not the same thing as a t-test. What is a t-test? Statistical test to evaluate the differences in means between two groups. So again, the means between the average age of men and women taking this class. We're going to evaluate that by a t-test. Reliability. The consistency of a measurement or the degree of which an instrument measures the same way over time with the same subjects. That is important to remember. So on your exam, there will be a certain number of practice questions and they won't be uh, highlighted as practice questions. You will take all of the questions on your test. But they are testing those questions over time for reliability. Do they test well about the same way every time with groups of people who take the test before they d decide that this is an item they want to include on future exams? So again, the degree to which an instrument measures the same way over time with the same subjects. And it reflects the estimated repeatability of a measurement. That is estimated in two ways. One is test-retest, the more conservative method to estimate reliability. And one should get the same score on exam one as one does on exam two. Internal consistency estimates the reliability by grouping questions in a questionnaire that measured the same content. So, for example, or the same concept. Um, one could write two sets of three questions that measure the same concept, say knowledge of lipid panels, and after collecting the responses, run a correlation between those two groups of three questions 
to determine if the instrument is reliably measuring that concept. Kronbach's alpha, I'm sure you've heard, is a common way of computing correlation values among the questions on instruments. As a correlation coefficient, the closer it is to 1, so optimal would be like greater than or equal to 0 0.7, the higher the reliability estimate of the instrument. So you have a Kronbach's alpha of 0.82, that is a very strong, reliable instrument. The major difference between test, retest, and internal consistency estimates of reliability is that test, retest involves two administrations of the measurement instrument, whereas internal consistency involves only one. And then I would know the difference conceptually in reliability versus validity. Validity is the degree to which a variable measures what it's intended to measure over time. And so there's construct validity among others, but the expert committee who sits on the uh, exams advisory, um, they decide these are practicing and uh, acute care MPs and faculty. There's a volunteer group and like 10 of them sit on the committee every five years or so and they look at new items that were written and they decide if this is a valuable and, and valid item to write. No, this is too much women's health. No, this item is too much uh, FNP. Oh, this is very good. It's about burn patients in critical care. All right, and they make the decision about the content or construct validity. Liability, the legal responsibility that an NP has for actions that fail to meet the standard of care, resulting in actual or potential harm to a patient. And standards of care are used as criteria to measure whether negligence has occurred. Negligence, how is it different? It is failure of an individual to do what a reasonable person would do that results in injury to the patient. The bad part about negligence is most people don't know that they're neglecting to do something. And that's why you need a good relationship with your primary physician. Is there anything else that you think I need to do? Could you look over this? I've never really had a patient with, hmm. And so here was my initial plan of care. Do you agree? And so a simple example of negligence would be you have a 90-year-old come into the internal medicine practice and he's gurgling with pneumonia. And you he said, oh, my chest has been sore all week from coughing and uh, I've just been a mess. And so he's, you send him over across the street to the hospital to be admitted. The ER calls and says, what kind of MI was he showing while he was over there with you? Because he's deteriorated over here. Well, you didn't do a 12 lead EKG. That would be negligent because even though you know the guy had pneumonia and he had a sore chest, anybody who complains of any kind of chest pain, the standard of care is to do a baseline 12 lead. Not only was he, did he have pneumonia, but he was also having an MI in your office. And so the charge would be negligence. Malpractice is a broader term. Failure of a professional to render services with the degree of care, diligence, and precaution that another member of the same profession under similar circumstances would render to prevent injury to someone else. And here you can think of lots of examples, but it's not just being incompetent. It's professional misconduct, unreasonable lack of skill, illegal or immoral conduct, like with prescribing opioids or something, and other allegations that result in harm to a patient. Notice that malpractice insurance does not cover advanced practice nurses, including nurse practitioners, from charges of practicing medicine without a license if the APN is practicing outside the legal scope of practice for that state. So you step out of your scope and you don't have anything to stand on. Assault versus battery. Assault is an intentional act by one person that creates an apprehension in another of an imminent harmful or offensive contact. Um, an assault is carried out by a threat of bodily harm 
coupled with an apparent present ability to cause that harm. So shaking a fist in the air in the direction of another person, making the motion to inject someone against his will, okay, putting somebody in fear, basically, it would be the charge of assault. Whereas battery, an illegal, willful, angry, violent, or negligent striking of a person, his clothes, or anything with which he is in contact is battery. One can commit battery on an unconscious patient, but not assault. Defamation, a communication that causes someone to suffer a damaged reputation. They're said to be liable, that is defaming um, a person, for example. Distributed written material saying lies about that person or their practice, where slander is spoken defamation spoken to other than the defamed person, okay, the defamed party. Involuntary commitment. Can you involuntary commit somebody? Yes. In most states, there is a duty to commit someone who is in danger of hurting himself or others as a result of mental illness. So attempting suicide, for example. A nurse practitioner is potentially liable if a patient is discharged while in danger of hurting himself or others. How about the use of restraints? It is legal to forcefully restrain someone to prevent a patient from harming himself or others. Yet the NP must document the exact reason and rationale for why restraints are being ordered. Um, an NP may be liable if excessive restraints are employed, the exact reason for using restraints is not documented, or safety checks of the restraints are not charted by the nursing staff and then confirmed by the NP. So you have to have a reason, slapping the nurses in the breast, for example, trying to pull out the Foley or the endotracheal tube, there has to be very clear documentation of why you tied that person down. Good Samaritan statutes protect healthcare workers from lawsuits who aid at the scene of an accident and render reasonable emergency care that's within the NP's scope of practice. Then a recap on our way out of this chapter, hang in there with me. Sensitivity, put a little plus sign next to sensitivity, specificity, a negative sign next to specificity, and always change the words. When you see sensitivity, positives. When you see specificity, negatives. So the true positives, sensitivity. The degree to which those who have a disease screen or test positive is sensitivity. Specificity is the true negatives. The degree to which those who do not have a disease screen or test negative. What about incidence versus prevalence? Incidence is the frequency with which a disease or disorder appears in a particular population or area at a given time. So incidence is the frequency. Prevalence, on the other hand, is the proportion of a population that's affected by a disease or disorder at a particular time. So just remember, incidence is the frequency Prevalence is the proportion. Primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Does this sound like something haunting from your past, right? Well, one more day of haunting, and that's on exam day. And, you know, then you can uh, Google it the rest of your life, right? But let's get it down in case you have a question. Primary prevention includes measures to promote health prior to any recognizable problems. So it has a lot of P's with it. Prior to the onset of problems to promote health, P, 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 P. The most important word to remember for primary prevention is prior. It has to happen prior. Vaccinations and immunizations, that's a big one. Exercise, wearing seat belts, avoiding tobacco, all those are prior to an event to prevent disease. Secondary, the key word is screening, SS. Secondary screening focuses on screening, early identification, and treatment of existing problems. 
So if you find high blood pressure, you're going to do something about it. Therapeutic lifestyle changes, thiazide, diuretics, get them started. Again, screening is secondary. So pap smears, cholesterol screens, prostate checks, any kind of screen is secondary. And finally, or lastly, we have tertiary. Tertiary includes rehabilitation and restoration of health. Two things to remember. Tertiary, the key word is rehab. Any kind of rehabilitation initiative is tertiary. And what is the goal of tertiary prevention? Remember this, rehabilitation and restoration of health. So somebody's having physical therapy after a stroke. They're doing cardiac rehab after an MI. Okay, these uh, are great examples. Here's another one. Somebody begins to take daily 81 milligram aspirin to prevent another MI. That's not primary because they've already had an MI. It is tertiary prevention to prevent another MI. And then our last subject, but important here, cultural competence. And let's practice a question before I get into the discussion. Your patient only speaks Korean and you need to evaluate pain. Since you don't speak Korean, which of the following would you utilize? The answer is A, a visual pain scale, not D. Okay, some of you might have picked that. Let's talk about it. Uh, first of all, least invasive, least expensive. Write that down one more time. You always pick the least invasive, least expensive method first. And so if I can go in the room with a laminated card or I have it on my iPad and I just show it to the patient, they point at which face is better for them, we're done. Even if I don't speak Korean, right? Easy. When it's easy, it's easy. And least invasive, least expensive. I love this question. Um, you do not rely on the family and you do not just call HR and have them find somebody, hopefully in the hospital, all right? Everybody got that? So use the least invasive, least expensive, a visual pain scale first. And then, of course, if that doesn't work, you would move on to an AT&T interpreter. Culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Very important here. The class initiatives. First of all, ultimately, what was the aim of this class initiative? And the aim of the standards is to contribute to the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities and to improve the health of all Americans. There are three class standards that are most significant to the AGACMP, and I would know these well. There are 14 class standards, and I would know that three of these are particularly important for the acute care MP. First of all, healthcare organizations must offer and provide language assistance services, including bilingual staff and interpreter services at no cost to each patient or consumer with limited English proficiency at all points of contact in a timely manner during all hours of operation. Okay, so we usually do that through AT&T or some interpreter service, okay? Further, the next one, healthcare organizations must provide to patients and consumers in their preferred language, both verbal offers and written notices informing them of their rights to receive language assistance services. And so if you are going to have Korean speaking patients in your practice and you don't speak Korean, there needs to be a handout in Korean and they need to be hooked up with somebody who speaks Korean to tell them and also for them to read that they have a right to, to this assistance. And lastly, healthcare organizations must assure the competence of language assistance provided to limited English proficient patients by interpreters and bilingual staff. The family and friends should not be used to provide interpretation services except upon 
uh, request by the patient or the consumer. Okay, so organizations must assure the competence of language assistance provided to that patient by interpreters and bilingual staff. So just because you don't speak Korean, right, um, then you're going to go out and get some help and you have to make sure that help was competent, was good. And you can't rely on the family. Now, say that slight, with slight limitation that, you know, you could say, ask your dad how his, how his belly is today. Since his surgery yesterday, is he feeling any better? That's pretty easy and you're not digging too deep. But of course, when you would never want to use the family is with any kind of informed consent because you wouldn't know exactly what was explained to the patient in terms of all the risks and benefits of the procedure. So it would never be appropriate to use the family in that light. And that in concludes our huge chapter on practice issues and legal and ethical principles.